these controls. Hughes was ready. The eight engines kicked on and the crowd cheered. With Hughes at the controls, the giant flying boat glided smoothly across the three-mile stretch of harbor. From 35 miles per hour, it cruised to 90 miles an hour during the second taxi test when eager newsmen began filing their stories. But they were too eager. Hughes wasn't finished. Catching the media and the crowd unaware, Hughes lowered the wing flaps and taxied a third time. Now for Mr. Hughes' surprise. As the enormous craft approaches her 95 mile an hour takeoff speed, the pilot lifts her out of the step and holds her there as she races through the choppy sea. And with the final drive of her engines, 200 tons are airborne, five months ahead of time. 70 feet off the water, she stays for a mile. $23 million worth of airplane has answered a lot of committee questions. It can fly. The unexpected flight left the crowd and the world stunned. Hughes comment to the astonished newsman, I like to make surprises. Howard, did you expect that? Yes, certainly, I like to make surprises. You were surprised or not? Oh, I said I thought I'd make a surprise. The giant seaplane was never to fly again. At Hughes' insistence, she was kept secluded and flight ready in a specially built climate controlled hangar. Shrouded in mystery, she remained entombed for 33 years at an annual cost of $1 million. Time caught up with both Hughes and the flying boat. After Hughes passed away in 1976, the hangar's lease expired and plans were made to disassemble the historic seaplane. Sumer Corporation Hughes Holding Company decided to divide her up, parting her out to the Smithsonian and eight other museums, and then destroying the rest. The Aero Club of Southern California, along with the Rather Corporation and aviation enthusiasts throughout the nation, stepped in to save her. On October 29, 1980, the flying boat emerged from seclusion and into the international spotlight. The world's largest floating crane, Herman the German, lifted her onto the dock of the temporary storage area. What was expected to take only a few hours took almost two days. In February 1982, a new site was ready. The flying boat was taken by barge down Long Beach Harbor, then gently eased into her new domed home adjacent to the Queen Mary. In the late 1980s, the Disney Corporation purchased the former holdings of the Rather Corporation. Disney discontinued the dome exhibit after two years, leaving the flying boat looking for another home. Once again, the Aero Club took on the task of locating a permanent residence for the flying boat, and after reviewing many proposals, awarded her to Evergreen International Aviation on July the 9th, 1992. Evergreen's plan, as envisioned by Captain Michael King Smith, proposed to not only preserve and protect her, but also to display her as a central exhibit in a living museum. The move to Oregon brought a new set of problems for the flying boat. It would require disassembly, packaging, transportation, and reassembly. A workforce including some of the original flight crew carefully planned and documented the project to ensure a successful journey. Disassembly began August 10, 1992, and concluded six weeks later with the plane in 38 separate pieces. Crews created the propellers, engines, and smaller parts, shipping them via Interstate 5. A large opening was created in the dome, and the remaining pieces were shrink-wrapped and rolled out onto an ocean-going barge. After traveling 980 nautical miles from Long Beach, California, the control services, horizontal stabilizers, wings, vertical tail, and fuselage arrived in Portland, Oregon. Thousands of people celebrated the arrival with an official proclamation of Spruce Goose Day, declared by Mayor Bud Clark on October 22 at Tomacall Waterfront Park. The water levels of the Willamette River delayed the flying boat's trip from Portland to McMinnville. The water was either too high for passage under bridges or too low for migration from the river to land. The large pieces remained in storage for several months. 
Finally, conditions improved and the flying boat slowly made her way upriver, setting new records at historic Willamette Falls for the longest and highest load ever to pass through the locks. After landing near Dayton, the caravan of pieces stretched more than 1,500 feet down the narrow road. The flying boat arrived in McMinnville at Evergreen International Aviation on February 27, 1993. A Spruce Goose homecoming parade converged down the final mile of the 138-day, 1,055-mile trip from Long Beach. Shortly after the successful arrival in McMinnville, tragedy struck when the museum's co-founder, Captain Michael King Smith, died in an automobile accident. His father, Delford M. Smith, founder of Evergreen International Aviation, persevered and continued his son's dream of an educational institute and living museum. The Captain Michael King Smith Educational Institute and Evergreen Aviation Museum were created in honor of Captain Smith's life, dreams, and accomplishments. The project continued as dedicated crews of volunteers restored the flying boat's exterior in a temporary storage area. They replaced the deteriorated fabric on the rudder and elevators and remove the old paint by hand from the fuselage, wings, vertical stabilizer, and floats. The paint removal exposed inspection stamps, signatures of men and women who worked on the original construction, and evidence that the Duramole had passed wind shear tests. The large pieces of the flying boat were sanded, primed with a white latex finish, and repainted in the original silver flight color. Preparation began for the final 800-foot move from temporary storage to the new museum. Moving crews, news crews, and spectators began arriving during the early morning hours of September 16, 2000. At 10 a.m., the B-17 Flying Fortress signaled the beginning of the procession across Highway 18. The vertical tail came first, followed by the right and left wings each spanning a distance wider than the five-lane highway. As the tail and wings slowly made their way around the bends toward the new facility, the flying boat's fuselage began the trek, dwarfing the buildings it passed. The fuselage entered the hangar on September the 22nd and was lowered into its seven-foot pit a week later. Reassembly of the wings occurred on November 15 followed by the vertical tail on November 20th. The pylons were assembled on January 25th, 2001, and crews attached the eight Pratt and Whitney R4360 engines to the flying boat on February 23rd. Volunteers applied new fabric to the ailerons and began restoration of the flaps and horizontal stabilizers during the spring. They painted and prepared the propellers attaching them to the aircraft in early May. This was followed by assembly of the horizontal stabilizers on May 25th, just in time for the new facility's opening on June 6, 2001. After a busy summer, crews began assembling the flying boat's control surfaces. The flaps were assembled September 6, the ailerons on October 9, and the rudder and elevators were attached in early December. On December 7th, the 60th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, crews assembled the final piece, the tail cone. After a ribbon-cutting ceremony signifying the completion of the flying boat's incredible journey, 